You know, I think it's really important to get more and more people into this kind of thinking, right? And it and I don't know if I don't think the the administrators of healthcare systems are there yet. Some are, most aren't. But the physicians who are on the verge of burnout, who are recognizing this internal conflict within themselves, they are ready. I think, you know, I'm a huge proponent of meditation because meditation really has changed my life and the lives of everybody that I teach. Um, and, and I have a meditation program. It's freely available online. It's, uh, you know, I created it for patients, but then, you know, people from all over the world enroll in it and, and practice it. And, uh, but, you know, what we also need is to bring this into mainstream medical literature. That's what needs to happen. We need to bring, you know, people together from heart-based medicine to write papers, to write white papers, to write review articles, to write, you know, and publish. That's when we get noticed. It is through publications. It is through, and then once you have publications, you start getting invited to the mainstream conferences to speak. And then you speak, you, you talk about things there, right? So for the first time ever in July, I was invited to talk about stress in cardiovascular disease. Something that no, it, everybody knows, it's, it's a huge um, causative factor for cardiovascular disease, and yet there's no talk about it. And for the first time, I was invited to speak, and it really um, opened up communication among the physicians who attended. To, and it's not that my talk was special, but the more we bring this into mainstream medicine, that's when changes happen. We can't live in isolation and then have our little conference and then we all go off and do our own thing, right? That needs to disseminate into mainstream medicine where it becomes a movement. <laughs> I love that. So you really are saying it's a call to arms, right? It is. It is, it is a call to arms. You want change? Be the change. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we have to train the doctors because it's not by chance that the heart is left out. You know, the current paradigm is that we are rational beings uh, governed by physical processes and protocols, and we just have to fulfill those, and that's our duty to the client. No, we have to bring in the relational aspect as well, and for that we have to train the doctors, we have to create uh, trainings, institutions, uh, that combine the interior world, the relational world, with the exterior physical uh, process-driven uh, world that the medical uh, science is focused on. So we need, we need an integral approach, basically, where the interiors and exteriors are equally taken into account, and that's what probably healing is all about. What I, I, what I see as a psychotherapist, and when I'm saying psychotherapy, I'm saying not only working with clinically mentally ill people, I'm more interested in normal people who has internal issues and want to grow towards the higher human potentials, because there's a lot. So working with normal people with their interiors as a psychologist, as a psychotherapist, I see that once we open the heart towards the client, once we are there with our full attention and, and presence for someone, then all kinds of dynamics starts to happen. So the other person might be very enthusiastic that we are paying full attention, but also, um, you know, previous stuff, hidden stuff in the personality might jump up and come into the relationship, repressed fear, repressed sadness, repressed anger from the childhood will come out if we start to love the client. That means that the doctors also have to learn to deal with psychodynamics if they want to start to heal from the heart. So this is my proposal to the heart-based medicine that we need to give a doctors a certain amount of psychotherapeutic wisdom in terms of how to handle relationship 
when two people are really connected in a healing relationship. And also healing has to do with spirituality. So it's not just physical, technical processes. And spirituality happens and can happen also in the relationship. Spirituality is not just something happening in your Zen Zafu when you are sitting one hour at, the, at night, you know, that's personal meditation. That's when you empty your mind and open your heart and the deeper spiritual aspect of your being. But then you have to bring it to the relationship. And doctors have to bring it to the doctor-client relationship. And then actually in that relationship, besides the physical healing that needs to be there, of course, we don't want to deny that, but we want to extend that with the psycho-spiritual healing in the relationship to make it complete and holistic. I think, uh, and first of all, uh, for the physicians and for the doctors, they need to pre take the pressure away and from their, uh, from their minds, mindset. And uh, lots of doctors, in my observation, they, uh, they consider themselves as a saver or the, a lifesaver, right? Or they consider them, themselves, you know, this is a job I'm doing. Um, I do, I'm doing my business. So when you take that pressure away and you focus on the moment, I am helping my clients to live a better life. I'm only a helper. The person who uh, is he seeing you has the full responsibility for healing himself. So change the mindset and you're helping, and you're giving this authority or the power back to the patient and have the patient to awaken their chi and recognize they have the ability to help themselves. And here, doctors, and I am asking you for help. So. That will change the relationship between the client and the doctor, and uh, that the energy, the chi flows, will be much better. The healing takes place much deeper. On the one hand, you might think, you know, well, as, as a doctor, I gave up my power, I gave up my authority, and uh, I build up this uh, relationship with my clients, you know, you know, that might violate the law or whatever. And, uh, but I tell you, so once you, for instance, just put a smile on your face. Right? And uh, when your clients see your smile, that is the best encouragement. And then when you are in front of your patient, you take three long, gentle deep breaths together with your client. Okay, let's take three deep breaths. My, my friend, you know, so, mm. yeah. and then so, you, know, you can, uh, once you do that, you are breathing together with a client, right? And then, and uh, you can then you can ask something as you know, uh, how are you doing, and uh, know, what can I do to help you to feel better? Well, you have to first educate her when she's not frazzled, as to what the role of the heart is in the human system, which is what I, my talk was just about the last hour, and so. Once she understands the role of the heart and how it's not just a blood pump, but it's actually informing the brain and body, it's actually key to health and wellness, that it actually communicates neurologically, energetically, hormonally. Once she understands its role and what happens when you're not connected, then as simple tools she can use or techniques while she's on the go, to shift back to the heart, then she can do it. I mean, we, we're in hundreds of hospitals. Heart Math is being used by hundreds of trainers in hospitals and teaching it. We have 500 chief nurses in Stanford, Dignity, Kaiser, Cedar sinai other hospital systems throughout the United States, St. John's, Ascension hospitals. I mean, it goes on and on. VA hospitals who are actually teaching others, nurses and practitioners in the hospitals, how to shift to the heart, how to integrate the heart and mind, how to use it to de-stress in the moment and build resilience 
and prevent burnout and how to really activate and nurture why they went into the healing professions. So it's very much hit the ground running. Not everybody knows about it yet, so it will be. And that's a huge part of heart-based medicine. I mean, heart math is a foundation of heart-based medicine. It's the math of the heart and how activating the heart and having heart-based living, heart-based medicine enhances outcomes. Well, I know what I do, which I call, you know, an Adbanil method neuro movement. And from my work, I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, however, I work with a lot of people that consume a lot of medical attention, including small children with special needs and sometimes very severe conditions. And I have, over the years, done what I do and have seen uh, outcomes that are really outside of what was considered even possible. So. I looked at what it is that I was doing. I knew I was impacting their brain because when a child learns to do something they couldn't do, when a musician can play in a different way that the pain disappears, uh, you know, or so on and so forth, I know that the brain had to change for that to occur because the brain controls the movement. The brain controls how the child is thinking, moving, talking, what they can do, what they can't do. So that part was the baseline for me. But I asked, what is what I'm do about what I'm doing that drives such dramatic changes? And I came and defined nine essentials. And I'm going to list them very briefly here. And what happens is when I or we apply the essential, it gets us better. And they're not time consuming. They just require awareness of them and the choice to, you t to a, a act a, a, in a way that abides by, the, abides by the essentials. So the first one is movement with attention. So let's say you're going to perform surgery, open heart surgery. Oh my God, I mean, I don't think I'd ever have a courage to do that, right? You're going to move. You know, you're going to move your arms. You're going to to do actions. The people around you are going to do the same. You can move and just a few seconds at a time, just go inside and say, how does my arm feel? Oh, if I move the, my elbow a little lower, my shoulder will be a little less tense. Just like that. And, and then you just go focus on what you're doing. And then you re rerun it at a certain moment. Maybe you feel a little bit tight or so, And you pay attention to how you move. Your brain wakes up and is like alert and ready to create new connections. That means it brings you into very creative mode. You, you can do the same thing if you're in the gym and you're on the treadmill. Uh, 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 you, you, you can slow it down a bit and you can pay attention to how you feel when you move. And you do that for a minute or two, you go back to the previous speed, you'll see that you're moving a lot better because the brain is built to always look to optimize our function. If you didn't do that, none of us would survive. None of us would learn. Obviously, it, the brain selects which connections and which patterns to use. And my understanding and belief is that it always looks to optimize the best it can at any given moment. So that's the first essential. The other one, slow. Slowing down allows us to feel what's going on and lets the brain operate at a much higher level. I won't go into all the information system and, you know, theory and all that stuff. But slowing down, it, it's not a big slowing down because you have to do what you do. It's almost like a feeling slowing down. And if you, if you finish doing the stitch four seconds later or earlier, unless, again, it's a life and death situation, that's kind of slowing down is not going to make a difference. If you have a patient in your office and you talk to them and you just take a deep breath and you let, give them a little, you slow them down because they think you're in a rush and they try to tell you everything fast. You say, it's okay. I can give those extra two minutes. Tell me what it is. You don't go to chit chat. You don't waste your time, but you slow down the process. Everybody gets elevated. The whole hormonal mechanisms work better. And not just your patient is better. You're better. You're happier. The, the other one is variation. It's like you do things and it becomes very routine. Some things have to be routine or it endangers the patient. But the, wherever you can do something in a different room, 
uh, uh, decide to open your conversation in a different way. It awakens up the brain, it, uh, it wakes up the, the vitality of the system. Uh, uh, enthusiasm, when you're working with a patient and they look to recover, that you're having the, the understanding that if you amplify the small changes, they will heal and you say, look it, yesterday we were like this, today you're like that. You have a really body that can heal. The outcome of the healing can completely take a new trajectory of a much better one. So these are just four of the nine essentials. And if doctors just took that, they will do better, not just their patients. It's more than just self-preservation. It's just the quality of the ongoing experience and, and that the experience is more an um, enlivening one because the stress is intense. I said, I don't think I could ever be a surgeon. I don't have it in me. I can do what I do well, but I don't. So, so or it's not just a surgeon. You can, if you're a general practitioner, I, I have a wonderful doctor. I've, had, I've started with her when she just finished medical school. I've been with her for a long time. And I, she has to deal, I, I, I have a friend that I sent her who is now battling very, very serious cancer and she was the one that figured out something is really, really wrong. You know, so it's, it's, it's a life, it's truly life and death profession. And in the meanwhile, there's a way to make it, to, to do it that makes it a much, much better experience for the, for the practitioner, for the doctor. This has been a Heart-Based Medicine production. Thanks for listening.